All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. You have the power, spiritual power, in depth. Use it. My friend David Hartman, MC of the great and popular morning television show on ABC called Good Morning America, is the son of a minister. And David takes on, I'm sure, a great many of his father's characteristics. He says that his father used to say to him, God created you in his own image, and therefore he is in you, and you have the power of God within yourself. And that is a fact. You, as a believer, as a child of God, have the power of God right inside of you. Let me remind you of something that you may forget, but you must never forget it. You are greater than anything that can ever happen to you. You name it, build it up out there as big as you can make it, and you are greater than it is by the power that is within you. Therefore, don't quail and whimper and whine and act weak in the presence of all these difficulties, you have the power. Use it. The Bible tells us, to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God. It seems to me that many people today who try to be Christians have never realized how terrific, how tremendous Christianity really is. He gives you authority and uh, power over difficulty. Anything. For example... I was in a motel dining room one morning. I was alone. I went down for breakfast. It was snowing outside. Dark and overcast. And the waitress was a middle-aged black woman with a glowing face and bright eyes. And as she seated me at the table, she said, Good morning, my friend. I hope you feel good today. Isn't it a wonderful day? Well, I looked at the snow outside. And uh, I always did like snow anyway. And I said, Yes, ma'am. It's a beautiful day. And I feel real good even better for having met you. And I added, you have a terrific spirit. Where did you get it? Why, she said, my friend, where else could I get it but from the dear Lord Jesus Christ? Now, she didn't know me from Adam. And this was not a put-on, this was real. And she was busy getting my food, bacon and eggs, coffee, whatever you have. And in the midst of coming and going, we held a conversation in which she told me, she said, I was living in poverty. And I hated poverty. 
Did you ever live in poverty? She said, and I had to admit that I'd been close to it one time, but never in poverty. She says it destroys the personality of poverty. And I was on relief, and I didn't want to be on relief. And I didn't feel good at all. But one day she said, I was reading the Bible. And I was reading Luke chapter 9, verse 1. And that changed everything for me. Well, I couldn't remember what Luke 9, verse 1 was at the moment. So I asked her what it was. And she quoted it to me. Now, now, just listen to this one, will you? If you think that Christianity is some nicey, nice, little, sweety, sweety thing, listen to this one. Luke 9, verse 1. And Jesus called his disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and all disease. What do you think of that? And she said, when he first stated that, it was to these disciples, who were they? Nothing but a bunch of fishermen, tax gatherers, and ordinary people. But he said he was with us until the end of the world, and that means I'm one of his disciples and she said, he gave me power and authority over all devils. And one of those devils was poverty. And another devil was fear. And another devil was resentment. And he gave me power and authority over all of them. And I wasn't feeling good. And he gave me power over my sickness. And what do you know? I took that power and that authority, and I'm happy, and I'm feeling good. Ah, oh, you know, that's what it's all about. That's why Christianity's lived for 2,000 years. That's why every other kind of a gimmick rises, has its day, and passes away. But Christianity lives forever because it gives the individual power and authority over all devils and everything else. Now, you may think this is exaggerated. The other day, somebody sent me a clipping from a Chattanooga, Tennessee newspaper. The News Free Press, I believe they call it. About four women who were in a dress shop. Three of them were clerks. One of them was a customer. Should be the other way around, I suppose. And one woman was in a dressing room putting back on her dress after she'd tried on some prospective new dresses. And the three clerks were out there waiting for her. When all of a sudden a door burst open and in came a great big tough looking guy with a knife in one hand and a revolver in the other. And he said to the three clerks, hand over your money. And all they could muster up between the three of them was $55, which enraged him. And so he hit them all and knocked them down on the floor and said, lie down there. And if you make a noise, I'll kill you. And he, then he heard some back, body back in the dressing room. And he went back there. And this woman was uh, there. So he pushed her around, manhandled her, got her money. Then for some reason or other, he cut her with a knife and threatened her and beat her. And all of a sudden, according to the Chattanooga News Free Press, she pulled herself up to her full height. And she said to him, In the name of Jesus Christ 
I command you to stop this wickedness. A look of astonishment overcame his face. He was bewildered. He turned and ran from the shop, leaped into a car where he had a woman accomplice, and sped away. They captured him later, both of them. And when interrogated, he said, This woman had a power I'd never seen before. No, you're not going to have anything maybe as dramatic as that. But you've got something that's about halfway got you licked, haven't you? You don't feel well. You're sick. You've got some kind of a pain. Or some great big problem. Or some great big tough difficulty. You have the power. Use it. So that's the first thing, authority. Take authority over it rather than allowing it to have authority over you. So the first thing is authority. And the second thing is faith. Faith. If you have faith built into you, you can rise above anything and you can handle it. Faith. In crisis, in difficulty. Now, you know, last Friday, I don't know whether you remember last Friday or not, May, this is May 8th, that must have been May 6th. It was a beautiful day. I was up at my farm in Dutchess County and also attending the meeting of the ministers here. But I left that meeting about the early afternoon and then it was, it was a loveliest day in May. Now, somebody wrote a poem once, What is so rare as a day in June? Well, it's a day in May. <laughs> but you know, in this great northeastern country, I wouldn't live any place but in the northeast where the weather can become tough one minute and idyllic the next. It's exciting. So it was beautiful, and then all of a sudden came up a terrific rainstorm, and up on... Quaker Hill in Dutchess County where I have my farm it developed into a mini cyclone in an instant great trees were uprooted and hurled over the roadway and trees had great big branches shaken down out of them we have an oak tree and a huge part of that oak tree came down and I got to wondering how my apple tree had survived it. Now, I have an apple tree that the tree man tells me has got to be over a hundred years old. It must have had a trunk one time that had a diameter of two and a half feet. Big branches. But you know, time has passed. And the trunk has been eaten away until at its thickest point it isn't over four inches. And in the center of the tree is a large hole. I measured it 18 inches high and nine inches wide. Nature's tried to restore it by building up new bark. But hadn't quite succeeded. And I went down looked at my old apple tree after this mini hurricane and you know what it was doing it was putting out blossoms and i smelled the blossoms and they were fragrant and i said to the tree what's the matter with you you're over a hundred years old you shouldn't be putting out blossoms 
And the tree said to me, what you saying? <laughs> now it had no idea it's a hundred years old. And the storm hadn't bothered it any. You'd think an oak tree could stand up to it, but the ap it didn't, but the apple tree did. Now, come September, there'll be apples on that tree, and they'll be sweet. Of course, when you bite into one, you get a worm or two, <laughs> but that adds to the taste of it. <laughs> we made some of the most delicious applesauce out of that, those apples last year. You ever saw? What's that tree got? That tree has God in it. God thought of an apple tree. Only God could think of an apple tree. And he built power into it so that it would stand up in a, a crisis. Oh, God built that into an apple tree. He built it into you, didn't he? Because he loves you more than any apple tree. And he tells you that you have power. For he says that to many, as many as receives him to them, gives he the power. Well, I know. I know how it is. Even though you listen to this and you may agree with it, and you may even buy it, which I hope you will, because it's, it's, it's valid. It, it isn't all that easy to be a positive thinker all the time and to have good, solid faith. I sometimes think that we were, as little children, inoculated with negativism, and we have to spend most of our life getting over it. Now, my wife and I were in England recently for three weeks. We were around in the country district. We'd been up in the country several times in England before, but this time we really lived in the country. And uh, we stayed in little country inns. And in none of these inns was there ever more than 30 people. And after dinner, they'd all gather in the living room, which they call the drawing room. And then why they call it the drawing room? Anyway, they'd serve coffee in there, and we all talked to each other, and we had a lot of fun and so forth. And one of these inns we stayed in was for the second time. And we drove down there one beautiful day through the Vale of Evesham. Isn't that beautiful? The Vale of Evesham. Over here we call them valleys. Over there they call them vales. And I think vale is much prettier than valley. And the fruit trees were in bloom in the Vale of Evesham. And so in the afternoon we came to this inn. And I remembered back to the first time we'd been in that inn, a few years ago. We always would stay in London, and we'd stay at one hotel because I liked this hotel. It had the biggest bathtub I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I always got the same room, and it was delightful. And in the morning, they bring in scones hot right out of Scotland and jam, and it was nice. And I was comfortable in it. And finally, my wife said, we're not going to stay here anymore. We're going to leave because we're getting into a rut. And she said, I found an inn up in England, and it's a beautiful old inn, and I want to go up there. She said, this inn is full of history. Charles I once slept there. I said, he got beheaded. And she said also, Cromwell once slept there. And I said, he wasn't so hot either. <laughs> and I don't want to go up there. I like it here. I said, besides, they wouldn't have a good bathroom up there. 
Well, she said, we're going because I've checked out here and made a reservation. <laughs> so we arrived at this inn about nine o'clock at night, and the bellboy, believe it or not, couldn't have been any more than 89 years of age. <laughs> he was apparently there when Charles I was there. <laughs> and he creaked. You could hear his bones creak. And I, I said, no, sir, don't you pick those bags up. I'll pick them up. He said, you're no spring chicken yourself. <laughs> oh, we went up to this room, and it was called the Great Chamber. And that impressed me. And I went in, there were three beds in there. And I looked them all over, and the biggest bed was uh, the one I picked out. And I, I sat down on it. And I said to my wife, I wonder if this mattress was here when Cromwell was here. With me. <laughs> then up in the head of the bed, I noticed where it said, In the Domino 1620. And I was caught with the antiquity and eternity of life. And I said to her, look at that, 1620, this bed was made. And I said, think how many people have died in this bed. <laughs> She said, the trouble with you is you're a negative thinker. Think how many babies have been born in this thing. <laughs> and I was properly rebuked. Faith in the good God and in the Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, will give you power over any crisis. So you got authority and you have faith and then you have love and love is full of power. I think I was reading our guidepost magazine, the Korean edition. I wasn't reading it in Korean, but I knew the English version. About a man named Ellerbach, Max and Grace Ellerbach. They lived in Cincinnati and they had a little boy named Craig. And he was a beautiful boy, and everybody loved him. He had such a wonderful smile. And they always taught him, when he went to kindergarten, to look two, twice, both ways, before he crossed the street. And one day, Mr. Ellerbach got a telephone call that Craig had been hit at a crossing. And he went there, and he found Craig lying in the street. His golden hair wasn't even rumpled. He picked him up lovingly. They carried him to the hospital. He died in the children's hospital. A boy had been on patrol, and he signaled him across when suddenly, out of nowhere, came this car at a high rate of speed. The boy leaped for his life, but it struck Craig down. So Mr. and Ms. Ellerbach came back from the hospital. They saw the empty bed. Mr. Ellerbach broke down and sobbed like a baby for his little boy. Night after night, he did this. Then he was seized with a tremendous hatred. He dipped this boy, and he told the lawyer, he said, you do every legal device to keep him from being treated as a juvenile. Throw the adult book at him, slap him into jail, ruin him for the rest of his life. That night after night, he paced the hall. And one night, as he said, Dear Jesus Christ, help me. Dear little Craig, wherever you are, help me. And he said, all of a sudden, he gave a great sigh. And all of this evil flowed out, and he said he was filled with inexpressible love and joy. And he went into his wife, who was sitting up in bed, staring straight ahead, and she looked at him and gasped, and he said, Grace, the answer is love. I've been set free by little Craig and by God. So he said, let's, let's get to know this George Williams who killed him. 
They found out that George had no father. His mother worked all night and slept all day. And they finally took him into their home. He became a workman in the shop. He became their foster son. He's now a captain in the United States Army with two daughters of his own. And says, Mr. Elbach, when Craig died, I was a grown man, he was a little boy, but after he died, he was a grown man, and I was a little boy. And he taught me love. And I had the power. And that's it. Authority and faith and love. 